Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 358th episode, we have a bunch of news, including three new dinosaurs. I have two Spinosaurids, and I think you have a new dinosaur as well. Yep. So there's a lot of dinosaurs. We also have Dinosaur of the Day, Sarasaurus, and I have a fun fact about dinosaurs eating whales. What? Yeah, it's pretty crazy. But before we get into all of that, really quick, we want to thank some of our patrons. No new patrons to thank this week, but we have lots of existing patrons that we like to thank. And they are Lucas and Eli, DC Cassandra, A Moose, Red Sox Rex, Cosmic Parasaur, Ewan, The Georges Family, Richard, Cameron, and Quinn Pomeroy. Yes, big thank you to all of our patrons. We really appreciate you. Thanks so much for supporting us in the show. And if you want to join our growing community and get your own shout out, then head on over to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash I know Dino. Yeah, we also have our referral contest, which just wrapped up. Oh, yeah. So we now have a winner, and that is Ulysses. Awesome. Ulysses will get our silver $20 T-Rex coin. From the Canadian Mint, I think in 2016 was the year it was released. They had six referrals, so that was the winning number. Those are people that actually signed up to listen to the podcast. I know a lot of people went and visited the page or previewed it, but I guess the website is fancy and it can track who actually signs up for the podcast Yeah, as a subscriber. So thank you and congratulations to Ulysses for winning the contest. And we'll be reaching out shortly to get your mailing address, send you the coin. But for everybody else, and I guess Ulysses too, if you're interested, refer.fm slash I know Dino is still active if you want to sign up and get other rewards when you refer your friends. Thanks for referring your friends. Yeah, referring people and Patreon are the two best ways to support us. In addition to listening to us week to week. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. (laughs) So on to the news. I'm going to kick it off with our two new Spinosaurids because I think that's pretty big news. We don't get new Spinosaurids all that often. Mm -hmm. And these are both new genera, too. It's not just two new finds. It's two entirely new dinosaurs known to science. So this new paper was written by Chris Barker and others and published in Scientific Reports. Both of the finds are from the Isle of Wight, which is just south of the main island of Britain, and it's on the southwest coast of the Isle of Wight, also known as Bryston Bay, and that area of the island is the Wessex Formation, or a small piece of the Wessex Formation, and it's in the Wealden Group, or I think it's sometimes called the Super Group, because it's pretty spread out, but it's about 125 million years ago. That's the important detail you get from that, which puts it in the early Cretaceous. It's the same formation as Baryonyx, so they may have coexisted. So there might have been three Spinosaurids running around at the same time? Maybe, but we're not entirely sure about that because they weren't found in the exact same fossil location, like they weren't buried together. They were in the same formation, but it's possible if they were like evolving quickly that one existed and then another one existed shortly afterwards. It's hard to say with only a couple fossils. And even though Baryonyx was around the same time, it was actually found about 100 kilometers away in Surrey. It wasn't actually found on the Isle of Wight originally, at least. It also puts them about 25 to 30 million years before Spinosaurus, the namesake of Spinosauridae. They gave Spinosaurus a chance to evolve into something weirder. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, that's possible. It also gave them a little bit of time to grow bigger because these guys were only about seven to eight meters long, very roughly, because this is based on some relatively small pieces, which would put them about 25 feet plus or minus a few feet in that ballpark and that's in the same sort of range as baryonyx whereas spinosaurus obviously was much bigger still pretty big yeah yeah definitely not not tiny like the early tyrannosaurs where they were super small and then they got way bigger they started out relatively big the two new genera named are ceratosuchops and riparovenator the full name of ceratosuchops is ceratosuchops inferodios And Ceratosuchops is Greek for horned crocodile face. So it's got a long face with horns. Yeah, it basically the horn refers to its large brow boss, Mm -hmm. (laughs) sort of giving it like an angry eyebrow look, (laughs) like a big 
rough brow above its eye, basically. But sort of horn-like, you know. Mm -hmm. And then inferodios comes from infernus in Latin for the underworld and erodios in Greek for heron. So it turns into hell heron or hell heron. It's a crocodile and a heron. Yeah, pretty much. That's a good description of a spinosaur, I think. Mm -hmm. Combine a big carnivorous, mostly fish-eating bird. And it looks intimidating. Yeah. And they emphasize in an interview that herons are usually thought of as fish catchers, but they actually have a pretty varied diet. So we think that spinosaurs probably ate a lot of fish, but maybe they had a little bit more of a varied diet. And so maybe that's similar to ceratosuchops. Maybe it was eating a lot of fish, but also occasionally eating other stuff. The other genus and species is Reparovenator milneri, with Reparovenator being Latin for riverbank hunter, and milneri after Dr. Angela Milner, who co-authored the original baryonyx description, but sadly recently passed away. Oh, that's nice to have that namesake. Yeah, definitely. Especially considering these fossils at first glance, you might assume were baryonyx Mm -hmm. since they're from around the same time and place and have a lot in common being spinosaurids. All of the bones in this paper were found between 2013 and 2017. So they're all actually pretty recent. Mm -hmm. Several fossil hunters found different pieces of the individuals, but fortunately they knew the collection locations and then they all ended up donating their pieces to the museum. Cool. And that museum is the Dinosaur Isle Museum, by the way. And also a group from the local Dinosaur Isle Museum excavated a large portion of a tail. So it's a real team effort here. Yes. The tail that they found belongs to Reparo Venator. So that's sort of the more exciting of the two finds, I think, because we have a lot more of the body or the animal itself. Mm -hmm. They also found the tip of the snout which is technically a partial premaxilla, if you're interested in the jargony version of it, the brain case, and a, quote, preorbital fragment, which is basically a couple of fused bones from in front of the eye. For ceratosuchops, they also found the tip of the snout and the brain case, but they didn't find really anything else. So both of the finds include partial teeth in the premaxilla, And so there's some good comparisons to do there, as well as in the brain case, there's a lot of things you can compare. That's how they know they're two different species. Yes, and two different genera as well, because they separated them out not only to species, but also genera one level up. Right. And yeah, they could do an easy direct comparison. And we also have the snout tip and brain case of baryonyx. So all three of them we can compare, which is pretty good because a lot of time with spinosaurids, we don't have much overlapping material and it Mm -hmm. becomes a big guessing game of whether or not these things actually are different genera or if we just found different pieces of the same animal. Both ceratosuchops and Reparo venator have narrow snouts that expand a bit at the end as basically I think all Spinosaurids do. They have the same sort of slightly bulbous nose (laughs) that (laughs) Spinosaurus and Gharials have. You know, it's just sort of like, it's very narrow and then it puffs out at the end. It it looks really funny when you see it up close. Mm -hmm. It would look terrifying when it's alive. Yep. But as just a a single bone, it looks kind of goofy. They also have differences in their teeth positions and other details, which is how we know that All three of these, Ceratosuchops, Reparo Venator, and Baryonyx, are all different genus. So like I said, they found a good portion of the tail of Reparo Venator. It's much more like a typical theropod tail, though, than it is like a Spinosaurus tail. Interesting. So Spinosaurus has those incredibly long, thin spines on the top of its tail vertebrae, presumably covered in a fin-like sail, which is just... It was very surprising when Mm -hmm. it was found. Well, surprising to some people. To the people that thought this is definitely a very aquatic animal, it was not surprising. It was like justification for their hypothesis. But Reparo Venator basically is about even. So the neural spines on the top and the chevrons on the bottom of the tail are about the same height. So the vertebrae basically goes through the middle of the tail rather than on Spinosaurus. It's really close to the bottom because it's got this really tall neural spines above it and the chevrons are pretty short below. So it doesn't seem to have that same crazy tail sail that we see on Spinosaurus at least. And for the record, Allosaurus and Tyrannosaurus both have a deeper bottom of the tail. 
So this might even be slightly more Spinosaurus-like than a typical theropod, depending on what you're comparing it to, because we think that Allosaurus and Tyrannosaurus had like a big caudofemoralis muscle, and they had a lot of muscle attachments on the bottom of the tail for quick locomotion on land, whereas with these two new Spinosaurids, or really I should just say Reparo Venator, since we didn't find the Ceratosuchops tail, it's about even between the top and bottom, so maybe it didn't have that extra muscle on the bottom, or maybe not as much extra muscle as some of the other dinosaurs did. That'd be interesting if eventually they found more of the tail of Ceratosuchops and it was more Spinosaurus-like. Yes, <laughs> yeah, that would be great to see. <laughs> So they, they didn't really depict too much about Ceratosuchops. They made a combo skeletal diagram showing what the bones were in sort of a silhouette of the dinosaurs. And they depict Reparo Venator roughly like Suchomimus. And that's based, I think, on the relative height of those tail spines near the base of the tail. So they're a little bit higher than some of the other theropods. So they presume that they would have sort of continued into significantly longer neural spines above the hips, which might have given it that same low sail that Suchomimus has, or we think Suchomimus had. And that means that it has significantly longer neural spines than Baryonyx, which we don't think had a sail. But in their skeletal drawing, they cleverly put Reparo Venator in front of Ceratosuchops so they didn't have to guess about its sail and give it, you know, like a Baryonyx-like back or a Suchomimus-like back. They could just sort of hide it behind and just show a little bit of its head peeking out. <laughs> show the parts they're more confident about. Yeah. I think it's a good call. Mm -hmm. The only previously published specimens of Spinosaurids from the Isle of Wight are teeth and a lone vertebra. In the past, they've been called Baryonyx, since it was named from around the same time and place. However, the tooth enamel appeared a little bit different on some of those teeth than Baryonyx. But since we don't have a complete set of jaws of any Spinosaurid, we got a pretty good combination if you like include multiple inv individuals of like one or two of the species, but we don't have like a full nice set. So it's hard to compare the heterodont teeth. You know, like if one individual had slightly different teeth shapes in different parts of the jaw, we can't really tell that. And we also don't have many ages of Spinosaurids. So if the teeth changed as they grew up, we don't really know, you know, it's hard to say what they might have looked like at, at different ages. So it's possible still that these teeth are from Baryonyx, but now we know it could look different because they were actually from different animals. It doesn't necessarily have to just be an unusual Baryonyx tooth. It could just be a Ceratosuchops or a Reparo Venator tooth or maybe some other Spinosaurid that we don't know. Because yeah. if there were three, maybe there were more. I found it kind of funny. The authors wrote Spinosaurids are phylogenetically, quote unquote, unstable, which I don't think is something I've heard before. Like phylogenetically unstable makes it sound like just on their own. They're jumping around evolutionarily. <laughs> <laughs> but really, it means like, you know, as we find any new individual fossil, it tends to just completely mix up where they belong on our dinosaur family tree. So this paper resulted with Reparo Venator and Ceratosuchops as sister taxa, which sometimes can be risky because it might mean that they might get lumped in the future. But I don't think that's the case because Ceratosuchops does have a different brain case where we can see that, you know, boss above the eye, whereas you don't have that same sort of thing on Reparo Venator. And then again, there's some sl slightly different tooth positions. So they're probably, I think, are going to stay as distinct genus. I don't think it's really going to be questioned. But the next closest relative to them was Suchomimus in Africa. It might also be why they chose it as the skeletal with the longer spines above the tail, like the low sail. And then one farther away is Baryonyx. So you've got these two that are from the Isle of Wight. You've got Suchomimus from Africa, and you've got Baryonyx also from Europe. And those four alone make up Baryonyxinae in their analysis. Then on the other side, you got Spinosaur A, and that includes the rest of the Spinosaurids, which also include Europe, Asia, South America, and Africa. That's a lot of Spinosaurids. Yeah, they're pretty spread out. I mean, we find the teeth all over the place. I know they find teeth in Japan and all sorts of places, but it's hard to find. Usually they don't find the actual fossils of the bones. All of the earliest finds, both from Spinosaur A and Baryonyx A, are from Europe. So Europe is our best guess for the origin of Spinosauridae, which is the group that includes both. 
but we're still really not sure exactly when Spinosauridae evolved because it looks like their closest common ancestor with a different family should push their evolution back to like the very earliest Cretaceous or late Jurassic. And we don't have any fossils from that time period yet. So we're not really sure exactly what's going to fill in these gaps. And it's possible that Baryonyx, Reparovenator, and Ceratosuchops all live together. But like we were saying before, we're not really sure. They might have been in different niches or living in different areas. So they may not have actually encountered each other all that often. Plus, if they were around the origins of Spinosauridae, it's possible that they were evolving pretty quickly and none of these genera were around for all that long before the the next one took over in quick succession a relatively quick succession you know it could have been a million years in between them all right we got another new dinosaur this one is a chasmosaurine ceratopsian from the hall lake formation so upper cretaceous of south central new mexico in the u.s it was published in cretaceous research by sebastian dalman and others And the name of this dinosaur is Sierra Ceratops Turneri. Oh, that's kind of a tongue twister. Sierra Ceratops. Yeah, I I felt like it flows nicely. Sierra (laughs) Sarah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So the genus name Sierra Ceratops refers to Sierra County, where the specimen was found. And it means Sierra Hornface. Or just Sierra Ceratopsian. Yeah. Because really... They're all horn faces. That's true. The species name, you'll like this, Garrett, it's in honor of Ted Turner, who owned the land where the specimen was found. And if that name sounds familiar, he's the founder of CNN, and he's done a bunch of other stuff. But he's also a philanthropist. Did you say, I'll like that one because I did a report on Ted Turner? Yeah. <laughs> that I did. He's <laughs> an interesting guy, that Ted Turner. Yep. He also owns a ridiculous amount of land, which makes it not too surprising that he owned some land where a dinosaur was found. Yeah. So part of Sierra Ceratops was originally described in 1998 by Lucas and others, but as Taurosaurus latus. Now this new description includes even more of the skeleton and obviously renames it to a new genus. The fossil was first found on private land in 1997 by Greg Mack from New Mexico State University, who was mapping the geology of the area. And most of the fossils were excavated in 1997, but then more of the specimen was excavated between 2014 and 2016. So that's why they're able to add on to the description. Gotcha. The skeleton was disarticulated, but associated. So these bones are found near each other. There were some fractures and some missing bones, and that may mean that there was some erosion that happened. The bones they found include parts of the skull, parts of the frill and the horns, vertebrae, dorsal ribs, parts of the forelimbs, and shoulder. The holotype's in the collections of the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science. It's about 16% complete, but it's estimated, Sierra Ceratops is estimated to be medium-sized, about 14.7 feet or 4.5 meters long. I would say that might even be on the small end of a Ceratopsian, at least a Ceratopsid Ceratopsian, when you're excluding the really tiny ones. (laughs) I guess it depends what you're including there. So Sierra Ceratops had relatively short brow horns. They found the right post-orbital horn core. That was about 24 inches or 60 centimeters long, but it was missing the tip. And the brow horn had a broad base. The horn core is short and robust, and it rises up and then curves forward, like with other chasmosaurines. But we'll need more fossils to know if the relatively short horn core is due to individual variation, you know, just this one skeleton, or if it's a characteristic of all Sierra Ceratops. Mm, Yeah, that's always the case. (laughs) You never know for sure if what you're finding as a unique feature is just a weirdo, Mm -hmm. or if it's an actual feature of most of the animals in that genus or species. Yeah, and chasmosaurines also tend to change a lot over time as they grow up. Especially in that ornamentation. Yeah, so some of these characteristics could be due to ontogeny while it's growing up. It did have large cheek horns that had a pyramid shape and a sharp tip, which is different from Taurosaurus, which had these short, blunt cheek horns, which are also known as epijugals. So Hall Lake Formation is in Sierra County, New Mexico. Other dinosaur fossils found there include a tyrannosaur and lots of ceratopsids, including Sierra ceratops, of course. Also ankylosaurids and hadrosaurids. 
You know, that name, the Hall Lake Formation, doesn't really ring a bell to me. But maybe we just don't mention that formation, even though we've mentioned some dinosaurs from it. Yeah, it sounded vaguely familiar to me, but I wouldn't be able to tell you why. <laughs> Especially if they're finding ankylosaurids. I should really know that one. Mm. <laughs> but back to the ceratopsian. <laughs> so Sierra ceratops is found to be a sister taxon to Bravo ceratops, which was found in Texas, and Coahuila ceratops, which was found in Mexico. So it's, according to the paper, quote, part of a clade endemic to the southwestern United States and Mexico, end quote. The authors of the paper noted that, you know, all three of these dinosaurs are pretty fragmentary. So they said, quote, support for this arrangement is limited. But these three dinosaurs, they lived around the same time in roughly the same area. And that helps show endemism in southern Laramidia, like certain types of dinosaurs that were native to this area. One uh, kind of related thing just wanted to point out. There's a figure of the phylogenetic analysis, and somebody on the dinosaur mailing list pointed out that in that figure, there's one taxa that has not yet been published. So we took a look, and I think it's Beastie Ceratops. So I wonder when that one will be published. Something mm. to look forward to. Yeah, a little Easter egg hiding in that paper. Mm -hmm. Now we've got a surprise fourth dinosaur. I think we said at the beginning of this episode there's three, but there's actually four dinosaurs. There's so many new dinosaurs coming out in the last few weeks. This one is Nevada Dromaeus Schmidi. So maybe you can guess where it was found. In Schmidtlandia? <laughs> yeah, that was it. <laughs> it looks like the paper is still in review as of this recording, so I don't have too much to say about it yet. But there have been lots of tweets and articles about Nevada Dromaeus. So it's the first dinosaur only found in Nevada. It lived about 100 million years ago, found in the Valley of Fire State Park, which is in Clark County, Nevada. It lived near a large river. It was herbivorous and bipedal. It was probably a fast runner. And there are some quotes that it said it was dog size, like a St. Bernard dog size. It's hard to imagine. Like a St. Bernard is not at all dinosaur shaped. No, so I wonder if in terms of the size, I guess, because it's on the bigger side. Maybe it's by weight, if they're saying St. Bernard. Because something that's like the length of a St. Bernard weighs like a tenth of a St. Bernard. Mm. <laughs> so it's, it's curious as a comparison. Well, when I find the paper, I can let you know more. Okay. But the fossils were found in 2008 during a thunderstorm. Nevada Science Center had a reveal party in Henderson, Nevada, Nevada Science Center is doing a lot of dinosaur research right now. They're, so they're doing research in five counties in Nevada. Hmm. So the species name is in honor of a person, not a land. <laughs> <laughs> it's James Schmidt, who urged one of the paleontologists who found the fossils, Joshua Bond, to look for the fossils at Valley of Fire. This is kind of the reason they ended up finding Nevada Dromaeus. And apparently we'll be hearing about another larger dinosaur from Nevada, a hadrosaur, in about a year or two. Oh, cool. So lots of dinosaurs coming out of Nevada. Nice. I mean, Nevada has a badlands-ishness about it, where there's a lot of basically barren land with rock outcroppings and things. So I could see how it could be a good place to find dinosaurs, as long as the rocks are Mesozoic. Mm -hmm. Next up, thanks to a listener from Beijing for sharing this story with us. The Shandong Museum announced on social media that they're going to have a Cretaceous dinosaur exhibition by the end of the year. Nice. And our listener checked with them and they said that the exhibit would actually be ready by the end of October. So it's really not that long from now. No. The end of this month. So that's something to look forward to if you're anywhere near Shandong. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Got one last news item. This is another update on Ubi Rajara. So Cretaceous Research has now withdrawn the paper that names Ubi Rajara. Before it was just temporarily taken down? Yeah, and they said it would be put back up at some time with an explanation, but now it says, quote, This article has been withdrawn at the request of the editor. The publisher apologizes for any inconvenience this may cause. It could be a big inconvenience if you want to know what this dinosaur is. Yeah. So according to science, the journal decided to withdraw the paper, quote, given that concerns regarding permissions for specimen export remain unresolved nine months after its initial publication, end quote. So Elsevier, who is the publisher of Cretaceous Research, 
also updated its policy that it will not accept papers about fossils that may have been, quote, collected and exported illegally from their countries of origin, are of uncertain provenance, or are deposited in private collections, end quote. And other journals have similar updates, including Science, Nature, Nature, Ecology, and Evolution, and Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Now, because of this withdrawal, there may be more talks about what to do with the Ubi Rajara specimen to find a quote-unquote agreeable solution, which could mean a lot of things, but at least there's a dialogue going again. Yeah, I'm not sure how much of a dialogue is going. It seems like people are really digging in their heels and it's just coming to a head and eventually Cretaceous research was like, well, this isn't actually going to get resolved in a timely fashion, so I guess we have to fully retract it and then wait for somebody to work it out before we can have it back up. That doesn't mean it won't get worked out. Yeah, that's true. Just will take longer than everybody was expecting. Yeah. Yeah, I would really like to know what's going on behind the scenes there. I'm sure there's been quite a few conversations happening. Oh, yeah. I'm sure there's a lot happening. I think it's it's probably a good thing. I can understand why Cretaceous Research doesn't want to like be the one to decide if this was legal or not with the exporting because you've literally got the people in the country where it was exported from saying this was illegal Mm -hmm. and then the people on the other side saying no it was legal it's not really up to a journal to decide what export rules are (laughs) you know it's it should be up to courts or some other group not publishers to figure that out Mm -hmm. but i really like the update i also really like that they included that comment about Fossils that are of uncertain provenance or are deposited in private collections in there, too, because Elsevier is the world's largest scientific publisher. About 18 percent of all scientific papers come out through one of their journals. Mm -hmm. And since most people agree that people shouldn't have scientifically useful fossils in private collections where they're not available to science, That means that if you're publishing on something, it's scientifically useful by definition. So it should be in a repository where scientists should have access to it. So I like I like that piece of it because it doesn't they're not saying that people shouldn't own fossils Mm -hmm. or that that's a problem. It's that they need to be in some sort of scientific institution and you need to be able to tell where they came from as well with that uncertain provenance piece of it. So I like that. Yeah. And it sounds like more journals are coming to similar conclusions. So that'll be interesting seeing the effects of that going forward. Yeah, definitely. So overall good news, regardless of what you think of this specific case. Mm -hmm. I hope it gets resolved. Me too. I really, I still feel like why can they not just add some more authors to the paper, come up with some sort of agreement where it's going to be in one country for some period of time and then the other country make some models of it, all that kind of like There's probably a lot more behind the scenes that we just aren't aware of. I guess. It doesn't seem that complicated, though. This kind of stuff happens all the time, and usually it doesn't get so public and so contentious. Unless there's more stuff going on than we realize. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and now on to our dinosaur of the day, Sarasaurus, which was a request from PaleoMike716 via our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. It was a sauropodomorph that lived in the early Jurassic in what is now Arizona in the U.S., found in the Cayenta Formation from the Silty Faces. It looked kind of like a ground sloth. Really? Well, it's a sauropodomorph, not a sauropod. Interesting. So did it have a really short neck? No, it had a long neck, but it had powerful hands. Okay. Because sor- because sloths have pretty short necks. So that's like it's more about the hands that make it sloth like. Okay. So like a ground sloth with a really long neck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now its hands were smaller than a human's, but they were more powerfully built and they had these big claws. So I'm guessing this was a really small sauropodomorph if it's considered to have powerful hands that are smaller than a human's. Yeah. It's considered mid sized, about thirteen feet or four meters long and weighed four hundred and forty pounds or two hundred kilograms. Hmm. Still, that's still pretty heavy for only human-sized hands. <laughs> it's true. Although if uh, huge claws were on those hands, that does make a big difference. Yeah. The longest claw was on the first finger of the hand. So Sarasaurus may have been an omnivore. It also had powerful shoulders, and its scapula was hourglass-shaped. For big muscle attachments. Mm-hmm. As I mentioned, it had a long neck. 
It also had a robust build. It walked on two legs, and its forelimbs were shorter than the hind limbs, which you would expect walking on two legs. The humerus was 61% the length of the femur. Okay, yeah, so like two-thirds the length, maybe, Mm -hmm. roughly, for the forelimbs versus hind limbs. It also had long thigh bones, and its hind legs were column-like. They're a bit larger, and the neck vertebrae was lengthening. So you start to see these more sauropod characteristics. Sarasaurus helps show that sauropod traits may have developed in smaller animals first, and that helps show how sauropods grew to be so big. Sarasaurus didn't have air sacs in the skeleton, also known as the postcranial skeletal pneumaticity. It had large eyes. It didn't have a good sense of smell. There's no evidence it had a beak. But its lower jaw curved downwards toward the tip. Oh, weird. I guess we've seen that in some other sauropodomorphs. Yeah. It had 20 teeth on each side of the upper jaw, and the lower jaw also had 20 teeth. And these were quote-unquote, moderately heterodont teeth (laughs) that were serrated. So somewhat different. Yeah, moderately heterodont. That's funny. Yeah. So I guess that's why it might be an omnivore, because it's got different teeth. And you'd think like, well, maybe these teeth were for the meat and these teeth were for the vegetables. And also, why did it have these big claws? Yeah. (laughs) The type species is Cerasaurus orifontinalis. And it was found on a field trip in 1997 by researchers and then named in 2011 by Timothy Rowe, Hans Dieter Seuss, and Robert Rees. It took three 10-week field sessions over three years to excavate. They also found a Dilophosaurus specimen. Wow, that was a pretty good session. Yeah. Or pretty good 10-week sessions. Multiple sessions, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the holotype of Cerasaurus is nearly complete. It's an articulated skeleton and a fragmentary disarticulated skull. That one's known as TMM436462. They also found another partial skeleton, a different skeleton. So it's TMM436463. And a nearly complete skull of another specimen. That one's MCZ8893. Thanks for the specimen numbers. I needed those. I mentioned them because I wanted to make sure it's clear that these are three different specimens. Gotcha. So the holotype is a mature individual, but maybe not a full adult yet. But it's nearly complete, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. The nearly complete skull, the MCZ1, was originally thought to be Massospondylus sp, so some kind of species of Massospondylus. That skull was crushed and split, caused by swelling and shrinking of the clay around it after it was buried. And that skull was more juvenile than the holotype. The MCZ skull was found in 1978 and later known as the, quote, unnamed Cayenta prosauropod. Hmm. It was also informally known as the rockhead specimen because it was found from the base of a geographic feature known as rockhead. (laughs) Not because it had a particularly rock-like head? (laughs) No. (laughs) So the genus name, Sarasaurus, is in honor of Sarah, Mrs. Ernest Butler, a philanthropist who helped fund the Dino Pit exhibit at the Austin Nature and Science Center. Timothy Rowe helped create the exhibit and told Sarah, quote, if she really raised a million dollars to build the Dino Pit, I'd name a dinosaur after her. (laughs) He followed through. Good thing he had a dinosaur to name. Yeah. She raised that money in a year. Well done. Yeah. The species name Orofontanellus refers to Gold Spring, Arizona, where the holotype was found. It means gold of the spring in Latin. Interesting. Oh, because it's Gold Spring, Arizona, so it's Gold of the Spring Mm -hmm. dinosaur. Now, the discovery of Sarasaurus helped show that dinosaurs became more dominant after the end of the Triassic extinction event, and not by being so fierce and outcompeting all other animals. Because this doesn't look very fierce. Although ground sloths are pretty fierce, so I don't know. I think it's more when it appeared. Oh, because it's after an extinction event? Yes, because Sarasaurus was from the early Jurassic, and this is after the Triassic ended. There's this big extinction event, and now we're seeing different dinosaurs. Gotcha. Timothy Rowe said in an article by the University of Texas at Austin College of Natural Sciences that dinosaurs, quote, were humbler, more opportunistic creatures. They didn't invade the neighborhood. They waited for the residents to leave, and when no one was watching, they moved in, end quote. So they're more like squatters than burglars? I guess. (laughs) 
<laughs> or just opportunistic. In 2018, Adam Marsh and Timothy Rowe analyzed Sarasaurus with additional prepared fossils and CT scans, and they found Sarasaurus to be more closely related with sauropodomorphs from South Africa, South America, China, and Antarctica than sauropodomorphs from North America, which is interesting because it was found in North America. At the time that Sarasaurus was named, only three sauropodomorphs were known from the early Jurassic of North America. That's Ankysaurus and Sayatod, and another one that has not yet had a formal description, but it's kind of known as Fendusaurus. Fendusaurus. Interesting. So those three are not closely related. They're not part of the same clade. It appears that there were no ornithischians or sauropodomorphs in North America in the Triassic. At least no fossils have been found yet. And if that's true, it ends up being that they really weren't there in the Triassic, then Sarasaurus is one of the earliest North American sauropodomorphs. Hmm. And it possibly came to North America after some physical barrier was removed at the end of the Triassic. Or it's possible it took dinosaurs a long time to expand their territory. Yeah, that makes sense because there was a lot of competition still in the Triassic from lots of other groups. And even in the Jurassic and Cretaceous, there were always other animals to compete with in the different niches. Mm -hmm. So Sarasaurus lived in an area with a lot of streams, ponds, and lakes. And other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place included theropods, such as Dilophosaurus and Cayenta venator, Coelophysis, and Thyreophorans, such as Scolitosaurus and Scutellosaurus. And our fun fact of the day is about dinosaurs eating whales. Do you mean birds? Yeah. That makes more sense. Because whales didn't exist when non-avian dinosaurs were around. Yeah. (laughs) So in our interview last week, Cameron mentioned that seagulls don't eat whale carrion. But I did find a couple examples of seagulls eating whales. (laughs) So Of course, because they go for everything. They do. The most notable example is in the South Atlantic near Patagonia. And when I read that, I was like, wow, dinosaurs are still trying to rule Patagonia. Or they're just trying to see what they can get away with. And then they'll slowly, yeah, as we're unsuspecting, and they'll take over again. Exactly. That's what I'm thinking. So basically, gulls there have been attacking whales for at least 25 years. So they don't go for the carry-on. They want the live whale. Yeah. Yeah, so in, so weird. in that way, Cameron, I think, is still right that yeah. they're not they don't seem to go for a carry on much. They want the, the whole th- the fresh. Meat. That's way too much meat for a seagull. It is. And I should also add, if you love whales, you might want to skip this fun fact because. Oh, no, it gets graphic. It's intense the way that they go for these whales. So there was a report on fizz.org from 2013, and they outlined this nicely, although Like I said, it's been known about for at least 25 years. So in the 90s, people were already noting this. And it's because up to 2,000 southern right whales gather off the coast of Patagonia to breed and nurse their young each year. So they go after the young? They do. That would make more sense. Yes. I mean, they they don't really care. Right. It's because they're close to the shore. that That's why they're going after them, because gulls don't, like, fly far out. Mm. Usually, at least this type doesn't. Maybe there's some type of gull that does. But they stay close to the shore. And so when the whales come in close to the shore for their breeding and birthing processes. Surprised they're not scared by the sheer enormity of the whales compared to the gull. <laughs> Well, I mean, they can't really do anything to them, right? They don't have, like, any weaponry. Maybe they could try to hit them with a fluke or something, but they don't have a lot of defense. But because there's such a large gathering in the spot every year, it attracts a ton of tourists. I think, like, 100,000 tourists on average go there during the mating season to see all these whales. Because 2,000 whales, that's a ton of whales. So if you like whales, it's a great place to go. And people noticed that seagulls started attacking them. (laughs) And unfortunately, they noticed that a lot of these baby whales started dying. Oh, no. So it's sort of a a big issue right now down there. So basically what happened is like many gull species, kelp gulls, which are the gulls in this area, eat a lot of human leftovers. And just like when we were talking about with apex predators versus mesopredators, Mm -hmm. these kelp gulls are like mesopredators where they don't have an apex predator Or the humans are boosting them up by giving them extra food. And so these kelp gulls are eating lots of fish remains, discarded fish remains, like leftover fish, basically, Mm -hmm. that people don't finish eating that's in the landfills or stuff that we can't consume because we're not gulls that can basically consume anything. Mm -hmm. 
And this has led to a huge population boom of kelp gulls. They really are taking over again. Yeah. But, I mean, we're basically feeding them into overpopulation for the most part. But the presumed theory is that because of this overpopulation, they're starting to look for new sources of food because there's so many of them that they need more food. And whale blubber is very nutritious. And they get these huge groups of whales coming every year around the same time. And I guess the gulls have learned that. And so what they do is they fly out and they try to eat a little bit of the blubber while they're there. Ooh. So like you said, whales are way bigger than seagulls. An adult southern right whale is about the same length as a humpback, which is about 15 meters or 50 feet long. But they are heavier than humpback whales. They weigh about 50 tons. So it's a very large animal. And so it's weird that the small thing is eating it. It does happen a lot in the animal kingdom, though. It reminds me of that, what is it, crown of thorns, sea star? And it's like nothing can eat it because it's got these spines on it and it's super difficult. Except there's a little shrimp that can stand in between the spines and basically oh, yeah. like slowly eat off little pieces of it. So the size alone isn't necessarily a deterrent I won- for everything. I wonder if that ever happened to sauropods, something small was pecking at it. Yeah, it could be like an equivalent to like a vampire bat type thing, mm. like occasionally coming over and eating some. Or the equivalent of a kelp gull mm-hmm. might be a better comparison. Fear nothing indeed. I was thinking Dreadnoughtus, the fear nothing dinosaur, but oh. maybe it did have things to fear. It could be, yeah. So when a southern right whale is born, they only are about four to six meters or 13 to 30 feet long and have that sprightly weight of just one ton (laughs) it's still huge (laughs) they are huge but unfortunately for them their lung capacity is a lot lower than it is when they're adults Mm, so they have to be at the surface more exactly and i know that there are i've seen like statues of this where it's the adult whale sort of lifting the babies up to breathe at the surface of the water so they spend a lot of time at the surface and the kelp gulls have learned about that so they fly out and they peck through the skin and then they eat the blubber There's some more opportunistic behavior. Oh, yeah. So in order to prevent this, the whales will submerge. But as a gull, they can just fly and basically just wait for the calf to come back up to the surface and then continue pecking at the same spot. Because it has to breathe at some point. Yeah. And they want to, you know, it takes a little while to get through the skin. So they have to basically work on the same spot of the animal for a little bit. So these cuts can, after lots of little pecks, really add up to some pretty major wounds. Cuts from the gulls can measure up to 10 centimeters or four inches deep and up to a meter and a half or almost five feet long. Oh, ouch. So that is quite a gash. So that's a big problem. You know, obviously having these huge open sores could be problems. They could get parasites in those wounds or other infections. The gulls themselves might infect these wounds. But another problem is that these gulls will also attack the whale's parents if they're near the calves. Brazen. So, yeah. But what that means is that the parents sometimes separate from the calves because they're getting injured. And then since calves, you know, they're mammals, they have to drink the milk from the moms. If the moms aren't around, then the calves can starve to death. And they think that's what's really causing most of the deaths of these calves. So some years, over 100 calves have died in this area. So, yeah, it's a big problem. They started trying to shoot the gulls and bury the fish remains so that they're not overpopulating as much and things like that. But it is still a problem. It's also affecting the way that the whales behave because they'll dive under the water for longer periods of time. And that uses a lot of energy because they swim farther to try to get away from the gulls Mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And obviously the calves aren't as good at that kind of thing. So it's a problem for them. Interestingly, though, these whales elsewhere in the world aren't bothered by gulls. So it's only in this one spot that I could find. I couldn't find a single other example of gulls or any bird really attacking a whale, whether it's a southern right whale or any other type of whale. Well, it's like you were saying, it seems that they're driven to it. Yeah. They need the extra food. Yeah. Very specific set of conditions. I also only found one or two isolated cases of birds scavenging on dead whales and One of them, it's like there was a California condor that somebody saw on a whale, but they didn't actually see it eating. They just kind of assume it did. I found another picture of a gull that appeared to be picking some meat off of like a whale rib, but it's just like a one off, like in a very rare situation. It's like you wouldn't call a cow a carnivore because every once in a while you can find an example of a cow eating some animal. So 
is definitely not like a flock of vultures descending on carrion. These gulls definitely don't really seem interested in whale carrion. And then there's just the one example of where they're sort of being predatory on whales. Super weird. Mm -hmm. But on that note, I think maybe the reason that seabirds don't often attack whales is because they can sort of benefit from whales without directly eating them as food. So there's lots of seabirds that follow whales around and basically wait for whales to corral food to the surface and then eat that food instead of eating the whale as food. Makes sense. You can eat a lot more meals that way. Yes. And then maybe they don't associate the whale as the food, but it's Mm. more like, you know. This helps me. Exactly. Yeah. So there's one fun example, too. They they put a little like lipstick sized camera on an albatross Mm -hmm. and they found it way out in the middle of the ocean, intercepting some orcas that were hunting fish, Hmm. like snagging some of the fish that the orcas were doing. So it's not just near shore. That's also pretty brave because orcas are often pretty fierce. Yeah, I don't think they eat birds much, though. No, but they're known to play with their food and kind of attack in different ways. So That's true. Yeah, and I guess technically orcas aren't whales. They're dolphins. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I don't think orcas would tolerate getting pecked at like that. They'd probably find a way to fight back. Mm-hmm. Another example is that humpback whales mostly hunt small fish. And lots of seabirds also directly hunt those exact same small fish. But rather than diving into the water, what some birds will do is they'll wait for humpbacks to force the fish to the surface. And one of the main ways they do that is humpbacks sometimes use a method called bubble net feeding, which is really interesting. They basically blow lots of bubbles in circles around fish. They have to do it as a group. Mm -hmm. When they're eating solo, they use other techniques like lunging at the fish, and that probably doesn't help the birds as much. But when they do this bubble net feeding, they do like a big circle of bubbles. Well, sometimes they're kind of small, actually. They don't have to be huge circles. I think they can be down to only about 10 feet, but sometimes they're like 100 feet in diameter. And then they make a signal noise, and then they all swim up with their mouths wide open and gobble up as many fish as they possibly can. (laughs) But in that process, obviously, there's a lot of fish near the surface of the water. And so there can be just tons of birds around just picking off whatever they can find. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty interesting. The bubble net feeding thing is fascinating because the first accounts of it are from the 20th century. And they think maybe it was a response to whaling or some like increased level of gregarious behavior, like whale groups forming as a result of whaling, or the fact that they could feed quickly as a group and then scatter before like whalers got to them and things. It's just a really interesting concept. I I don't know where the science is at on that, but definitely benefits dinosaurs, that bubble net feeding approach. Yeah. And since humpback whales can eat up to one ton of fish a day, it doesn't really matter if seagulls sneak a few fish in the process. <laughs> yeah, they won't really... be missed. No. <laughs> As a side note, I'm still convinced that if humans wipe ourselves out, seagulls are the animals that are going to reinherit the earth in on behalf of dinosaurs, basically. And then evolve into something even weirder. Yeah. Although I guess, it, I mean, maybe chimpanzees could evolve into some other sort of primate-ish thing. It's another possibility. I can't believe that gulls go after whales. That's so crazy. It is. It's nuts. And I was I was trying to find other examples, and it's such an interesting topic that it like just dominates Google. If you search for like seagull whale, that's like all you find. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, that wraps up this episode of Vino Dino. Thanks for listening. And if you want to join our growing community of dinosaur enthusiasts, then go to our page, patreon.com slash inodino for all kinds of goodies, like ad-free episodes, if you're into that. So thanks for listening, and until next time.